Red and Slim found the two strange little animals the morning after they heard the thunder sounds. They knew that they could never show their new pets to their parents. Edgeworks Entertainment presents... Short Transmissions. Stories to rocket you into space. Tonight, Youth by Isaac Asimov. Part 1. Source, Gutenberg.org. There was a spatter of pebbles against the window, and the youngster stirred in his sleep. Another, and he was awake. He sat up stiffly in bed. Seconds passed while he interpreted his strange surroundings. He wasn't in his own home, of course. This was out in the country. It was colder than it should be, and there was green at the window. Slim! The call was a hoarse, urgent whisper, and the youngster bounded to the open window. Slim wasn't his real name, but the new friend he had met the day before had needed only one look at his slight figure to say, You're Slim, he added. I'm Red. Red wasn't his real name either, but its appropriateness was obvious. They were friends instantly with the quick, unquestioning friendship of young ones, not yet quite in adolescence, before even the first stains of adulthood began to make their appearance. Slim cried, Hi, Red! and waved cheerfully, still blinking the sleep out of himself. Red kept to his croaking whisper, Quiet! You want to wake somebody? Slim noticed all at once that the sun scarcely topped the low hills in the east, and the shadows were long and soft, and that the grass was wet. Slim said more softly, What's the matter? Red only waved for him to come out. Slim dressed quickly, gladly confining his morning wash to the momentary sprinkle of a lukewarm water. He let the air dry the exposed portions of his body as he ran out, while bare skin grew wet against the dewy grass. Red said, You've got to be quiet. If Mom wakes up, or Dad, or your dad, or even any of the hands, then it'll be, Come on in, or you'll catch your death of cold. He mimicked voice and tone faithfully, so that Slim laughed and thought that there had never been so funny a fellow as Red. Slim said eagerly, Do you come out here every day like this? Like, really early? It's like the whole world is just yours, isn't it, Red? No one else around and all that? He felt proud at being allowed entrance into this private world. Red stared at him sidelong. He said carelessly, I've been up for hours. Didn't you hear it last night? Hear what? Thunder. Was there a thunderstorm? Slim never slept through a thunderstorm. I guess not. But there was thunder, and I heard it, and then I went to the window, and it was raining, and it was all stars, and the sky was just getting sort of almost gray. You know what I mean? Slim had never seen it so, but he nodded. So I just thought I'd go out, said Red. They walked along the grassy side of the concrete road that split the panorama right down the middle, all the way down to where it vanished among the hills. It was so old that Red's father couldn't tell Red when it had been built. It didn't have a crack or a rough spot in it. Red said, Can you keep a secret? Sure, Red. W what kind of secret? Just a secret. Maybe I'll tell you and maybe I won't. I don't know yet. Red broke a long, supple stem from a fern they passed, methodically stripped it of its leaflets, and swung what was left whip fashion. For a moment, he was on a wild charger, which reared and champed under his iron control. Then he got tired, tossed the whip aside, and stowed the charger away in a corner of his imagination for future use. He said, There'll be a circus around. Slim said, That's no secret. I know that. My dad told me even before we came here. That's not the secret. Fine secret. Okay, ever see a circus? Oh, sure, you bet. Like it? Say, there isn't anything I like better. Red was watching out of the corner of his eyes again. Ever think you'd like to be with a circus? Like, I mean, for good. Slim considered. I guess not. I think I'll be an astronomer like my dad. I think he wants me to be. Huh, astronomer, said Red. Slim felt the doors of the new private world closing on him, and astronomy became a thing of dead stars and black empty space. He said placatingly, 
A circus would be more fun. You're just saying that. No, I'm, I'm not. I mean it. Red grew argumentative. Suppose you had a chance to join the circus right now. What would you do? I, um, I... See? Red affected scornful laughter. Slim was stung. I join up. Go on. Try me. Red whirled at him in strange and intense. You mean that. You want to go with me. What do you mean? Slim stepped back a bit, surprised by the unexpected challenge. I got something that can get us into the circus. Maybe someday we can even have a circus of our own. We could be the biggest circus fellows in the world. That's if you want to go in with me. Otherwise, well, I guess I could just do it on my own. I just thought, let's give good old Slim a chance. The world was strange and glamorous, and Slim said, Sure thing, Red. I'm in. What is it, huh, Red? T tell me what it is. Figure it out. What's the most important thing in circuses? Slim thought desperately. He wanted to give the right answer. And finally he said, Acrobats? Holy smokes. I wouldn't go five steps to look at acrobats. Mm, well, I don't know then. Animals. That's what. What's the best sideshow? Where are the biggest crowds? Even the main rings, the best acts are animal acts. There was no doubt in Red's voice. Do you think so? Everyone thinks so. You ask anyone. Anyway, I found animals this morning. Two of them. And you've got them? Sure. That's the secret. Are you telling? Uh, of course not. Okay. I've got them in the barn. Do you want to see them? They were almost at the barn. It's huge, open door. Black. Too black. They'd been heading there all the time. Slim stopped in his tracks. He tried to make his words casual. Are they big? Would I fool with them if they were big? They can't hurt you. They're only about so long, and I've got them in a cage. They were in the barn now, and Slim saw the large cage suspended from a hook in the roof. It was covered with stiff canvas. Red said, We used to have some bird there or something. Anyway, they can't get away from there. Come on, let's go up to the loft. They clambered up the wooden stairs, and Red hooked the cage toward them. Slim pointed and said, There's sort of a hole in the canvas. Red frowned. How'd that get there? He lifted the canvas, looked in, and said with relief, Oh, they're still there. The canvas appeared to be burned, worried Slim. You want to look, don't you? Slim nodded slowly. He wasn't sure he wanted to, after all. They might be... But the canvas had been jerked off, and there they were. Two of them. The way Red said. They were small and sort of disgusting looking. The animals moved quickly as the canvas lifted and were on the side toward the youngsters. Red poked a cautious finger at them. Oh, watch out, said Slim in agony. They don't hurt you, said Red. Ever see anything like them? No. Can't you see how a circus would jump at the chance to have these? Maybe they're too small for the circus. Red looked annoyed. He let go of the cage, which swung back and forth in a pendulum fashion. You're just trying to back out, aren't you? No, I, I'm not. It's just... A, they're not too small. I mean, don't worry. Right now, I've only got one worry. What's that? Well, I've got to keep them till the circus comes, don't I? I've got to figure out what to feed them in the meanwhile. The cage swung, and the little trapped creatures clung to its bars, gesturing at the youngsters with quick motions, almost as though they were intelligent. The astronomer entered the living room with decorum. He felt very much the guest. He said, Where are the youngsters? My son isn't in his room. Industrialist smiled. They've been out for hours. However, breakfast was forced into them among the women some time ago, so there's nothing to worry about. Youth, doctor, youth. The word seemed to depress the astronomer. They ate breakfast in silence. The industrialist said once, You really think they'll come? The day looks so normal. The astronomer said, they'll come. And that was all. 
Afterward, the industrialist said, You'll pardon me, I can't conceive your playing so elaborate a hoax. You really spoke to them. As I speak to you, at least, in a sense, they can project thoughts. I gather that must be so from your letter. How, I wonder. I couldn't say. I asked them, and of course they were vague, or perhaps it was just that I could not understand. It involves a projector for the focusing of thought, and even more than that, conscious attention on the part of both projector and receptor. It was quite a while before I realized they were trying to think me. Such thought projectors may be part of the science they will give us. Perhaps, said the industrialist. Yet think of the changes it would bring to society. A thought projector. Why not? Change would be good for us. I don't think so. It is only in old age that change is unwelcome, said the astronomer, and races can be old as well as individuals. The industrialist pointed out the window. You see that road? It was built before the wars. I don't know exactly when. It is as good now as the day it was built. We couldn't possibly duplicate it now. The race was young when that was built, eh? Then, yes. At least they weren't afraid of new things. No. I wish they would have been. I mean, where is the society of the before wars? Destroyed, Doctor. What good were youth and new things? We are better off now. The world is peaceful and jogs along. The race goes nowhere, but after all, there is nowhere to go. They proved that. The men who built the road. I will speak with your visitors as I agreed if they come, but I think I will only ask them to go. The race is not going nowhere, said the astronomer earnestly. It is going toward final destruction. My university has a smaller student body each year. Fewer books are written, less work is done, an old man sleeps in the sun, and his days are peaceful and unchanging, but each day finds him nearer death all the same. Well, well, said the industrialist. No, don't dismiss it. Listen, before I wrote you, I investigated your position in the planetary economy. And you found me solvent, interrupted the industrialist, smiling. Why, yes. Oh, I see, you are joking, and yet perhaps the joke is not far off. You are less solvent than your father, and he was less solvent than his father. Perhaps your son will no longer be solvent. It becomes too troublesome for the planet to support even the industries that still exist, though they are toothpicks to the oak trees of before wars. We will be back to village economy, and then to what? The caves? And the infusion of fresh technological knowledge will be the changing of all that? Uh, not just the new knowledge, rather the whole effect of change, of a broadening of horizons. Look, sir. I choose you to approach in this manner, not only because you were rich and influential with government officials, but because you had an unusual reputation for these days of daring to break with tradition. Our people will resist change, and you would know how to handle them, how to see to it that... that... that the youth of the race is revived? Yes. With atomic bombs? The atomic bombs, returned the astronomer, need not be the end of civilization. These visitors of mine had their atomic bomb, or whatever their equivalent was, on their own worlds and survived it, because they didn't give up. Don't you see it? It wasn't the bomb that defeated us, but our own shell shock. This may be the last chance to reverse the process. Tell me, said the industrialist, what do these friends from space want in return? The astronomer hesitated. He said, I will be truthful with you. They come from a denser planet. Ours is richer in the lighter atoms. They want magnesium? Aluminum? No, sir. Carbon and hydrogen. They want coal and oil. Really? The astronomer said quickly, You're going to ask why creatures who have mastered space travel and therefore atomic power would want coal and oil? I can't answer that. The industrialist smiled. But I can. This is the best evidence yet of the truth of your story. Superficially, atomic power would seem to preclude the use of coal and oil. However, quite apart from the energy gained by their combustion, they remain, and always will remain, the basic raw material for all organic chemistry. Plastics, dyes, pharmaceutical solvents, industry could not exist without them, even in an atomic age. 
Still, if coal and oil are the low price for which they would sell us the troubles and tortures of racial youth, my answer is that the commodity would be dear if offered gratis. The astronomer sighed and said, There are the boys. They were visible through the open window, standing together in the grassy field and lost in animated conversation. The industrialist's son pointed imperiously, and the astronomer's son nodded and made off at a run toward the house. The industrialist said, There's the youth you speak of. Our race has as much of it as it ever had. Yes, but we age them quickly and we pour them into the mold. Slim scuttled into the room, the door banging behind him. The astronomer said in his mild disapproval, What's this? Slim looked up in surprise and came to a halt. I, I beg your pardon. I, I didn't know anyone was here. I'm sorry to have interrupted. His enunciation was almost painfully precise. The industrialist said, It's all right, youngster. But the astronomer said, Even if you had been entering the empty room, son, there would be no cause for slamming a door. Nonsense, insisted the industrialist. The youngster has done no harm, and you simply scold him for being young. You, you, with your views, he said to Slim. Come here, lad. Slim advanced slowly. How do you like the country, eh? Very much, sir, thank you. My son has been showing you about the place, has he? Yes, sir. Red, I mean, uh, no, no, call him Red. I call him that myself. Now tell me, what are you two up to, eh? Slim looked away. Why, just exploring, sir? The industrialist turned to the astronomer. There you are. Youthful curiosity and adventure lust. The race has not yet lost it. Slim said, sir? Yes, lad. The youngster took a long time in getting on with it. He said, Red sent me in for something good to eat, but I don't exactly know what he meant. I didn't like to say so. Why, just ask Cook. She'll have something good for you young'uns to eat. Oh, no, sir. I, I mean for the animals. For animals. Yes, sir. What do animals eat? The astronomer said, Ah, oh, I'm afraid my son is city-bred. Well, said the industrialist, there's no harm in that. What kind of an animal, lad? A small one, sir. Then try grass or leaves, and if they don't want that, nuts or berries would probably do the trick. Thank you, sir. Slim ran out again, closing the door gently behind him. The astronomer said, Do you suppose they've trapped an animal alive? He was obviously perturbed. That's common enough. There's no shooting on my estate, and it's tame country, full of rodents and small creatures. Red is always coming home with pets of one sort or another. They rarely maintain his interest for long. He looked at the wall clock. Your friends should have been here by now, shouldn't they? The swaying had come to a halt, and it was dark. The explorer was not comfortable in the alien air. It felt as thick as soup, and he had to breathe shallowly. Even so, he reached out in a sudden need for company. The merchant was warm to the touch. His breathing was rough. He moved in an occasional spasm and was obviously asleep. The explorer hesitated and decided not to wake him. It would serve no real purpose. There would be no rescue, of course. That was the penalty paid for the high profits which unrestrained competition could lead to. The merchant who opened a new planet could have a ten-year monopoly of its trade, which he might hug to himself or, more likely, rent out to all comers at a stiff price. It followed that planets were searched for in secrecy and, preferably, away from the usual trade routes. In any case such as theirs, then, there was little or no chance that another ship would come within range of their subetherics, except for the most improbable of coincidences. Even if they were in their ship, that is, rather than in this... this cage... The explorer grasped the thick bars. Even if they blasted those away as they could, they would be stuck too high in open air for leaping. It was too bad. They had landed twice before in the scout ship, and they had established contact with the natives who were grotesquely huge, but mild and unaggressive. It was obvious that they had once owned a flourishing technology, but hadn't faced up to the consequences of such a technology. It would have been a wonderful market. And it was a tremendous world. 
The merchant especially had been taken aback. He had known the figures that expressed the planet's diameter, but from a distance of two light seconds, he had stood at this visi plate and muttered, Unbelievable. Well, there are larger worlds, the explorer said. It wouldn't do for an explorer to be too easily impressed. Inhabited? Well, no. Why, you could drop your planet into that large ocean and drown it. The explorer smiled. It was a gentle dig at his Arcturian homeland, which was smaller than most planets, he said. Not quite. And the merchant followed along the line of his thoughts. And the inhabitants are large in proportion to their world? He sounded as though the news struck him less favorably now, nearly ten times our height. Are you sure they're friendly? That is hard to say. Friendship between alien intelligences is an imponderable. They're not dangerous, I think. We've come across other groups that could not maintain equilibrium after the atomic war stage, and you know the results. Introversion, retreat, gradual decadence, and increasing gentleness. Even if they are such monsters, the principle remains. It was about then that the explorer felt the heavy throbbing of the engines. He frowned and said, mm, We are descending a bit too quickly. There had been some speculation on the dangers of landing some hours before. The planetary target was a huge one for an oxygen water world, though it lacked the size of the uninhabitable hydrogen ammonia planets, and its low density made its surface gravity fairly normal. Its gravitational forces fell off, but slowly with distance, and the ship's calculator was a run-of-the-mill model not designed to plot landing trajectories at that potential range. That meant that the pilot would have to use manual controls. It would have been wiser to install a more high-powered model, but that would have meant a trip to some outpost of civilization. Lost time. Perhaps a lost secret. The merchant demanded an immediate landing. The merchant felt it was necessary to defend his position now. He said angrily to the explorer, Don't you think that the pilot knows his job? He landed you safely twice before. Yes, thought the explorer, in a scout ship, but not in this unmaneuverable freighter. Aloud he said nothing. He kept his eye on the visiplate. They were descending too quickly, and there was no room for doubt, much too quickly. The merchant said peevishly, why do you keep silence? Well then, if you wish me to speak, I would suggest that you strap on your floater and help me to prepare the ejector. The pilot fought a noble fight. He was no beginner. The atmosphere abnormally high and thick and the gravitational potential of this world whipped and burned about the ship, but to the very last it looked as though he might bring it under control despite that. He even maintained course, following the extrapolated line to the point on the northern continent toward which they were headed. Under other circumstances, with a shade more luck, the story would eventually have been told and retold as a heroic and masterly reversal of a lost situation. But, within sight of victory, tired body and tired nerves clamped a control bar with a shade too much pressure. The ship, which had almost leveled off, dipped down again. There was no room to retrieve the final error. There was only a mile left to fall. The pilot remained at his post to the actual landing, and his only thought of breaking the force of the crash, of maintaining the space worthiness of the vessel. He did not survive. With the ship bucking madly in a soupy atmosphere, few ejectors could be mobilized, and only one of them in time. When afterwards, the explorer lifted out of unconsciousness and rose to his feet. He had the definite feeling that but for himself and the merchant there were no survivors. And perhaps that was an overcalculation. His floater burnt out while still sufficiently distant from surface to have the fall stun him. The merchant might have had less luck, even. He was surrounded by a world of thick, ropey stalks of grass, and in the distance were trees that remained him vaguely of similar structures on his native Arcturian world, except that their lowest branches were high above what he would consider normal treetops. He called, his voice sounding basso in the thick air, and the merchant answered. The explorer made his way toward him, thrusting violently at the coarse stalks that barred his path. Are you hurt? he asked. The merchant grimaced. I've sprained something. It, it hurts to walk. The explorer probed gently. I don't think anything is broken. You'll have to walk despite the pain. Oof, can we rest first? 
It is important to try to find the ship. If it is spaceworthy or if it can be repaired, we may live, otherwise we won't. Just a few minutes. Just let me catch my breath. The explorer was glad enough for those few minutes. The merchant's eyes were already closed. He allowed his to do the same. He heard the trampling and his eyes snapped open. Never sleep on a strange planet, he told himself futilely. The merchant was awake too and his steady screaming was a rumble of terror. The explorer called, It's only a native of this planet, it won't harm you. But even as he spoke, the giant had swooped down, and in a moment they were in its grasp, being lifted closer to its monstrous ugliness. The merchant struggled violently, and of course quite futilely. Can't you talk to it? he yelled. The explorer could only shake his head. I can't reach it with the projector. It won't be listening. Then blast it! Blast it down! We can't do that! The phrase, you fool, had almost been added, but the explorer struggled to keep his self-control. They were swallowing space as the monster moved purposefully away. Why not? cried the merchant. You can reach your blaster. I see it in plain sight. Don't be afraid of falling. It's simpler than that. If this monster is killed, you'll never trade with this planet. You'll never even leave it. You probably won't live the day out. Why? Why? Because this is one of the young of the species. You should know what happens when a traitor kills a native young, even accidentally. And what's more of this is the target point, and then we are on the estate of a powerful native. This might be one of his brood. That was how they entered their present prison. They'd carefully burnt away a portion of the thick, stiff covering, and it was obvious that the height from which they were suspended was a killing one. Now once again, the prison cage shuddered and lifted in an upward arc. The merchant rolled to the lower rim and startled awake. The cover lifted and light flooded in. As was the case from the time before, there were two specimens of the young. They were not very different in appearance from adults of the species. Reflected the explorer, though, of course, they were considerably smaller. A handful of reedy green stalks was stuffed between the bars. Its odor was not unpleasant, but it carried clouds of soil at its ends. The merchant drew away and said huskily, what are they doing? The explorer said, trying to feed us. I should judge. At least this seems to be the native equivalent of grass. The cover was replaced, and they were set swinging again, alone with their fodder. Short Transmissions was created by Heather Johnson Yu, produced and edited by Rachel Emerson. Music by Molly Walburn. Brought to you by Edgeworks Nebula. Tune in next week for the next episode of Short, Short, Short Transmission. Transmission. Edgeworks Nebula.